Great. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for taking time to join us today. It's another exciting edition of the Mentors on Stool session. And today we have uh, three heavyweights, as usual. And interestingly, uh, they are all people that I've worked with at one time or the other. And uh, the topic we're going to be treating for today is trends, the Nigerian consumer and the new realities. Trends, the Nigerian consumer and the new realities. And we have with us, we have Joshua Kimbanjo, we have Franklin Ozekome, and then we have Adidayo Adifila, three heavyweights who will be speaking to us on this topic today. Um, I'll just give you a brief of their profile, uh, saying that they all have like three pages each. We'll, we'll be able to take all of it. So I'll just give you a summary of their profile. So I'll start with Joshua Akimbanjo, and this is in no specific order. Joshua Akimbanjo is a business leader, a brand warrior, and a marketing strategist with an entrepreneurial mindset. A people leader, he manages the business portfolio, commercial leadership, innovation, and growth strategy as director and head of account management with oversight of overall revenue assurance at Inside Publicis, part of the Inside Redefinite group of the Troika Holdings, a member of the Publicis group with Pan-African Holding in Joburg, South Africa, and global headquarters in Paris. He has 20, over 20 years experience that cuts through consultancy, FMCG, telecoms, entertainment, fintech, and financial sector. And he has expertise in brand management, new product development and innovation, research, trade marketing, channel development, business development, and so on and so forth. In 2010, he joined Globalcom, leading the marketing and strategy for mobile marketing promotions and championed the SIM registration and Man United campaign. By 2023, he by 2013, I beg your pardon, his passion for growth and innovation led him to the technology landscape where he employed his expertise as head marketing and communications at Main One Broadband Cable Services before joining Inside Publicis in 2014 as a business director. Joshua isn't carried away by show business. He weighs on the value and matrix that enable the business of the show. And that's Joshua Akimbanjo, uh, a city ovation for him, saying that we're on Zoom and we won't be, do, won't be able to do a standing ovation. City ovation for Joshua Akimbanjo, please. Fantastic. So we'll move on to Dayo Adifila. Dayo Adifila is a quintessential integrated marketing communications practitioner with a digital transformation proponent. He has over 20 years of cumulative experience working at some of the nation's best advertising agencies, and of course, some of the biggest businesses building domestic and multinational brands. Daya Defila holds a degree from the University of Lagos, um, and his professional career took a creative turn into advertising. At first, as an account executive at LTC Advertising, evolving over the years into diverse functions such as copy group head, and later head strategic planning and digital marketing. He became co-founder and CEO of Hot Source Digital between 2011 and 2017, leading his team to an unprecedented hat trick of back-to-back -back Digital Agency of the Year awards, amongst others. Over the years, Dayo has served as pioneer digital marketing faculty at Orange Academy, a faculty member at Simon Page Business School, a trainer and examiner at, at the Advertising Practitioner Council of Nigeria, which is APCON, and, all the, and other advertising training camps. He's a fellow of the Institute of Strategic Management Nigeria, a member of the National Institute of Marketing Nigeria, and also an alumnus of the Senior Management Program of the Lagos Business School. He's happily married to Omoumi, and they have two awesome children. A sitting ovation for Daya Adifila, please. Okay, and next uh, is Franklin Ozekome. Franklin is Group Strategy Director um, at Leo Bonnet. He helps brands and businesses thrive in a connected world, developing transformational campaigns and implementing ideas for new products, services, platforms, and experiences. He leads the strategy practice of Insight Redefini, Publicis One, the Nigerian business group entity that comprises six leading marketing communications firms. He collaborates with the, connect, with the connection planners, data scientists, strategists, product managers, and entrepreneurs to design feature forward marketing toolkit programs and strategy playbooks for applied innovation and business transformation in the SSA market. Ozekome is passionate about trends research, consumer intelligence, and cultural foresight. He's the, creat he's the creative mind behind Think Africa, 
and B School, a strategy and innovation, an innovation academy for marketing and creative professionals. A city innovation for Franklin or Zekome, please. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I see that more people have joined us. And as more people continue to join, we'll kick off nonetheless. So, gentlemen, thank you for honoring our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here today. And the first question I'd like to ask, you know, today we're treating trends and um, the new consumer and the realities. Let's even say the realities of 2021, because, I mean, uh, things have changed a lot since the last time. Just so we are on the same page, because for different people, trends mean different things to that different people. Just so we're on the same page, and I'll throw this to Franklin Osekome, seeing that he is the one who is always the trend setter, the pop culturist, and all of that. What is trend? How would you define trend? Franklin, your microphone is muted. We can't hear you. Your microphone is still muted. OK, thanks. Is it better? Yes, sure. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, I said I wasn't going to use any dictionary definition. Um, to me, I believe trends emerge as innovators address people's basic human needs and wants in other ways. That means um, for you to regard it as a trend, you must have looked at it in terms of what are the core basic needs that people want and how have people addressed them you know, in new and innovative ways. Um, then I would consider it a trend. Otherwise, it would just be a fad or something that is fashionable. Um, so that would be my definition. Trends emerge as innovators address people's basic human needs and wants in novel ways. Joshua, you want to weigh in on that? The microphone. Yes, thank you. I observed it was um, muted. Um, you know, as we came on board here, I just realized that not all of us are practitioners of this uh, profession, and there might be people who, um, for sake of not using the big, you know, uh, industry language, I, I want to define it very simply as um, the behaviors and patterns of people that gets them to want to, you know, um, move into a new direction that enables them to first of all search for products decide on the product and adopt that product or brand as part of their lives. You know, oftentimes when I hear trend, what you might want to call immediately, if you look at the definitions that have been shared over time, uh, the quick thing for you to see is trend is almost like, you know, a, um, how do you call it, tide, you know, uh, something that just pops up. But for my point of view, I want to define trend from the perspective of consumer behavior. It is the behavior of the consumer that actually, you know, gives direction to that consumer as to how to experience, what to experience, and then how he needs to take a decision to either acquire, use, or become loyal to a particular brand over time. So that's where I want to put, uh, put define trend. But fundamentally, from the point of view, consumer behavior and to use you know industry balance now i hope that helps yeah sure fantastic so joshua um no sorry i've already asked joshua i'd like to ask uh daya defila how do you spot trend really uh -uh. because I there, 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 give there, you my own description let me give you my yeah, own. well maybe why you are, why you are also giving us the, your own description let yes. us know your own definition let us know how you spot trend how because you spot trend super yeah sometimes some people don't tend to jump on things that are in trend and mm. assume that it's a trend. So we need to be clear as marketing professionals because at the end of the day, we're all selling products or services. Mm -hmm. Super, super. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a short um, description, not a definition, just a description of, of trends as um, consistent and noticeable shift in direction, in movement.
towards another non-human it could be like you could talk about the trend in bitcoin prices uh, crypto am i shaking any tables yet no i don't want to shake any tables, very right? well yeah shaking. so and it could be <laughs> it could be it could be it could be what you call trend in people having lower income so manufacturers responding with um creating what you call such an economy, right? The such an economy where you create smaller single use products. So you're looking at a trend of more people having less disposable income over time consistently, and you are responding with a specific kind of product development. To meet that. So trends are consistent, noticeable shift in giving directions. How do you spot trends? Which was, you know, the follow-up question. So um, I think that's, that's the, one of the, toughest questions, but let's try to start to answer it a little bit. So I'll just give a couple of two, just two main things. One, you need to be deliberately curious about your environment as, as a marketing person, because you are basically a social scientist, right? So you need to be curious about what is happening in my environment. So if you were, if you consider yourself as too much of an introvert, well, you need to be deliberate about wanting to know what's happening in your environment. Now, the second thing is where, so before you go to how, you know, part of the how is, is you know, how do you come in contact with, with trends? So sometimes trends may just wash into your environment, right? You know, the thing is just too much. It's too environment. You are literally saying it everywhere you go. But sometimes it's not like that, especially if you want to, as a marketer, if you're looking at something you want to catch early, sorry, that's not my phone. Someone's phone is um, okay. Yeah. So if you had something early exam, say, okay, this is something I want to associate with. So what are some of the things that you, you can do to be able to spot um, trends? So one, we said about being deliberate. So that means you will have, you can have a group of people that, you know, they help you scout, right? For, for trends in given um, sectors, maybe youth sector, you know, um, you know, um, consumer product good sectors, you have people, or you just have simple good old fashioned email subscriptions that you have done, right? You know, to newsletters. But one of the best places where you can track trends now is Twitter, right? So you may say you're not a Twitter person, you know, but guess what? That's where you tend to see things at least 48 hours ahead of other people, right? It's on Twitter, it's from Twitter, it then jumps into other social media, like Instagram, you know, and, you know, whatever else you're doing. And so be deliberate about going to Twitter, deliberate about, you know, checking what is trending, be deliberate about also following some kinds of people in some kinds of industries, you know, people in, because when you say for our, our market, and I'll round up very quickly, um, you tend to find out, you know, who are the people that push, that amplify what becomes trends, which is something people consistently talk about and follow. You tend to find that it's entertainment people or people that are controversial somewhere or the other. So deliberately follow those people, create a list on Twitter for those kind of people. So when they post things, you know, you tend to see it quickly and stuff. I'll stop there because there's so much to unbundle in this, you know, so I'll let my colleagues also jump on that. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like uh, Franklin to weigh in on that question of how to spot trends. Yes, uh, I think uh, can, I can hear me this time. Yeah, I, yes, um, we can hear you. Hit it on the head, uh, but to break it down in a in a micro in micro shells, there are different kinds of trends, um, and it could get could easily be you know um, streamed over if we don't care. For. We have what you call the industrial market trends, we have, um, consumer trends, we have cultural trends, but the one key um, signifying factor among them is all about the consumer behavior, like Josh had said. Um, you have to know what's going on in your market or industry. You have to understand how um, cultural shift in your environment, things that are happening, of course. And you also have to know um, all of the things in terms of how people are consuming, behaving, purchasing, or what they're liking. And one key thing where you can spot trends is uh, pop culture. I think that's the singular basic place you can. When you see things happening in movies, film, entertainment, music, just begin to know that certain shifts are already pushing that genre. And those things precipitate the kind of things you start seeing in the next few weeks or few months. It can augur in a new, you know, uh, what you call, 
in terms of fashion, the kind of things that seeing people start dressing just because of a two minute video that people are crazy about. Or it could be a comic slang or a speak that a pop influencer mentions, you know, um, and you know, those things become very high polluting because that person has currency, social currency, or if it's a tweet that becomes trending and it begins to get, get um, Ghana um, hundreds of thousands of views, be sure to know that there are creators or business minds that are going to tap onto that speak, that trend, and then turn it into commercial success. So um, pop culture is one of the key ways. For example, just going to, I mean, we're shut down now, but if the, the idea would be go into a, um, a, an experiential event, let's say go to a club and, uh, before, before all of this lockdown, and see the kind of things people drink or wear, or the kind of sounds people listen to, or the top trending shows, and try to decipher what exactly is making this TV series or movie trend. And you begin to notice certain nounces. It could be um, a particular character and, the, and, and, and what he or she represents. It could be the couture that they are promoting or the kind of fashion or wear or, or, or what the character is about, you know. So the key things to note is one, Pop culture always sees trends. Two, look at core basic human needs. When there's always um, when there's always a gap in terms of what are things people always looking for, what are the core basic human needs? Then always know that it's possible to tap into a culture in there. And two, what are the drivers of change? What are the things that could possibly drive change? That's what we call shifts from time to time. Things that seem to appear all of huge and all of a sudden, and then they disappear. How do you tap into that uh, and big shift and then translate it into um, what you can gain either for marketing or for brands or for your individual self? So I think those are the key places to look out for things around you. That means your environment in terms of culture, what people are doing, how they are behaving, and of course, what's happening in your sector or category and how you can streamline those into how you can benefit for them. Fantastic. Thank you. And as we move to Joshua, I'd like him to help us understand how we can, how trends impact brands. Really, I mean, as a brand manager, as a marketing manager, or maybe a CEO of a company, what, I mean, what's your business with trends? Should I just focus on my business and start running my business and not really bother what people are thinking about or what's happening in the, in the society? Why should I be worried about NSAS? Why should I be worried about all the other things that happen around me? You know, why should this, how does this impact brands? Thank you very much, um, Agons, and um, gentlemen, for the contribution on you know trend spotting. I think let's first of all bring our minds back to two critical points. Um, it's about the brands and the consumers, and what we do by whatever name it is called, it is to bring that consumer connection point. And so the brands that we talk about today exist because the consumers need them. So need fundamentally is the reason why those brands exist as we speak. And so when you then look at that, uh, I, I just thought, let me take, a, take, take some sort of quick shift back into 2020 when COVID hit and then there was a global pandemic. Um, in Lagos, which is basically, you might say that that's, Lagos is where, Lagos and to some extent Southwest is where you have a huge chunk of um, social media activators. And so a lot of things are going on online, uh, but not many people in the other parts of the country, and I'll be specific, the likes of Ibadan. I'm talking to people, for example, in Otoko, that's in Benue State, or engaging friends who are right there in Onija or Oba. Now, most of the time, as a brand custodian, the focus for us might be to want to look at those trends on social media or those actions on social media. But in reality, it's not reflecting on the guys on those parts of the world or those parts of the country. And significantly because they are to some extent disconnected from what we are saying. So there was a lockdown in Lagos, which was primarily the center of it and Abuja. 
you had guys out there in Abuja, sorry, in, in Ibadan, where you have a major Nigerian you know, uh, drinking sport, and they were all there having fun. Um, I happen to have been in such a place at that time uh, because of business and for some other reasons. And then I, asked, I started asking myself, so all these things going on within Lagos and they were screaming over in Lagos, why is it not affecting these guys? So that brings it back to two points. That one, first, I've established the fact that the brands exist because the consumers are there, first. So to that extent, the consumer is not even the king again because kings go to you know, bosses now <laughs> to seek for sponsorship. So the consumer is actually the boss, dictates. Let's understand that, dictates where your product or your brand should be. And so how do I spot changes in my brands without calling it trends? I look at, for example, where am I driving sales? Where is the product or the brand currently experiencing a northward journey? In other words, taking a leap in terms of volume. Not looking at how many new likes are following a product that I just dropped on Twitter or on Instagram, but specifically asking myself, how is this guy influenced? Whether it's in Lagos, whatever. So that's automatically start getting me to understand the consumer behavior. So if what I have actually just promoted is being driven by that guy in the Southwest or in the North, and I see that I'm not experiencing the same level of traction in Lagos, the quick thing to then start asking myself is, do I want to keep following this place where I'm getting the likes? Or do I want to start looking at where the volume is coming from, irrespective of where the dynamics is happening? So the ecosystems usually will influence how you know, the business goes on. In Onicha, in Aba, in Enugu, where at some point we are driving a particular beer brand, sales was low in Lagos, major activation was happening somewhere in the East, and to a large extent, a program that was supposed to last for three months took one month for a particular beer brand, I don't want to mention them, took exactly one month to finish over 7,000 outlets that the brand owners had to then quickly say, you know what, we want to cut off the budget because there's a limited budget. So they have to then take away budget, for example, from the Lagos agency or agent, you know, uh, the, the business that was running the activation for that company in Lagos, took the, the budget and funded the guys who are doing that same activation in the East because the East was driving volume for that brand. Now, that brand had a lot of exciting things on social media, mind you. But the difference now is in the reaction. Because remember, at the end of the day, the goal for that business is to push volume. It's not fundamentally interested in how much likes or how much followership is getting. It is how much followership in real time is actually happening for that brand. And that's a mistake I think most of the time we make as practitioners. We, we develop campaigns and then we assume that we are the ones the campaign is sometimes made for. Which is why I love the question you ask. How do you spot? Because in the spotting is where you know that you have a particular set of consumers or users of that product or brand actually actively engaged. We must get to the point now where we actually say to ourselves, let us stop thinking that advertising is actually for us. It's for that consumer because the consumer is the boss. And so if you understand that and you know, for example, the sales team is saying to you, or you are seeing the volume tracker on your, on your algorithm, showing you where you know, the volume is rising, you then know that, look, this is a, poor, a place to focus and then a place to drive activities and drive traction for that brand. And I think if you look at it from that point of view and stop our focus that, oh, it's happening right now on social media, so I want to quickly jump on it, um, then we will see how, in the real sense of it, as strategists, we are helping to grow the brand because that is the essence for why we exist. That is the purpose of which we gather. It's the reason for which we actually, most of the time, see we're developing strategies. It is so very crucial to understand those patterns, patterns by way of consumer behavior. And just give me one moment to cite an example. We, there's a particular bank that is very, very good at, you know, when we talk about these trends on social media, uh, something happens and the bank jumps on it. I was looking at the banking um, results for last year and evaluating them. 
and I happen to even have to have one of the guys from that company who now works with me. And I say, how has been your performance in the last two, three years? Because you guys, you know, back then, everything that happened on social media, you know, in terms of, let me call it tide, and not trends on social media, you jump on it. How has it impacted performance in terms of new customer base, in terms of results, in terms of, you know, uh, reactivation of dormant accounts, in terms of new, maybe savings account being open. And then you realize that first, from the point of view of results, they are not even within the top range because you have the other banks dominating and those all don't jump on those, you know, call it facts or, or trends or types. But what do they do? They are more focused on where do we have these guys who are Uh, network has to be kind to us. I was enjoying that um, particular discussion. It was. Yeah, I had to switch my network um, a few minutes ago as well. So Joshua, we we'll, oh. we'll start it out. Uh, maybe we can, yes, will. we can continue. Okay, um, let's continue. Uh, when he comes, he'll uh, maybe finish his uh, trail of thoughts. And I'd like to ask them um, there, they feel like, what major trends have you noticed in the last five years? So, so, Agmon, so um, Joshua made a very important um, clarification, which Franklin also, you know, started in his own initial submission. So the thing is, there are different types of trends, right? And it's important to, to understand you know, business trends, economic trends, you know, social, cultural trends. Um, I saw the, the set of questions that were shared with us, the panelists, you know, and somehow the questions seem to look more like consumer trends on, on online consumer trends, you know, which, which is what we talk about when we say brands are jumping on something because no, no worries. We, we figured it out. So um, I will I will speak about I will try to give different examples from different uh, ways of looking at trends, so that that also helps us not just you know get into polarizing on one direction or the other, um, because the the value of a trend is is insight, right? to get an insight out of it, to understand what does this mean potentially for me as a business. I give an example of the Sache economy, right? Which is businesses looking, and it's still continuing by the way, which is businesses seeing that the disposable income available to people is reducing, reducing, reducing. So they're thinking, how do I still continue? Do I reduce the size of the soup, for instance, from 110, you know, kilograms, uh, you know, uh, milligrams to, to, you know, to 90, do I retain the price? So that is one trend and it's continuing. And COVID has um, accentuated that, which is uh, disposable income has really come down. So more brands are thinking of how to create substitutes for those kind of um, audiences. Um, another trend from a consumer point of view that we've seen, uh, I think I'll stick with the last two years, right? Because 2020 was, was like five years on its own, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. So, yeah, um, so one, one trend that we've also seen is the, the urge and the, the need, the desire for convenience, greater convenience by certain cater of consumers, right? Maybe more of the middle class and the upper class, right? Con convenience. But you see, that could be a misnomer as well, uh, but let's just say consumers are showing more preference for convenience. How does that affect the brand? So a brand has to think about, one, how easy is it for people to access my product? How easy is it for them to understand what the key advantage of my product is? That is in communication, the container for communication that goes out, right? Where does it go, go out to them? Why? Because the information deluge is just huge. The amount of information that you that passes through your own personal stream, whether it's on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, I'm sure many of us, you can't be on less than 10 WhatsApp groups. If you're like the most stingy, stingy WhatsApp group joiner, 
of all time. <laughs> you will still be on at least 10 WhatsApp groups. I'm probably on like 30 or something like that, you know, and I'm constantly, you know, ejecting myself. So you have a constant stream. So, but let's talk about convenience. So what does that mean? That means, for instance, um, what can you do to make it more affordable for me? What can you do to make it easier for me to get your product? So yes, we talk about things like online sales, you know, digital sales or e-commerce, right? Um, yes, the, the trend in last year, 2020, showed that more people um, had gone online for certain, you know, kinds of groceries. So grocery, performance of groceries in e-commerce in Nigeria, for instance, went up, right? We noticed that. Uh, we also at PZ, you know, recently, you know, um, uh, you know, established presence on, on e-commerce, you know, uh, marketplaces, and we could see that trend. So convenience is now because there's so much on people's minds, right? The, the, the COVID experience, which is still happening now, is a huge burden on people's minds, people's psyche, right? And one of the reasons why entertainment continues to rise and rise is because it provides an, a form of escape, a way of relaxing yourself from the, the, the threat of, have I washed my hands? Have I, am I covering my face? People are dying. You most probably know at least two people that have died from COVID that, that you know personally. At least I know up to seven, seven people. So these things are influencing people's behavior. People are less, um, less inhibited now. They can see anything on social media now, right? Okay, so convenience is there. Right, we talked about um, such an economy. Inhibition is a critical thing. People are somehow discovering more about people power for some reason, right? And you've seen that play out in things like NSAS. Uh, if you look, if you look globally, and it's also affecting us in Nigeria. Look at what is happening with the what's the way to call it now? The Reddit gang, you know, the the, the retail investors versus you know big investors. It's a macro macro trend. Right, but it's signifying something. People that feel oppressed are feeling like they should gang together and go against whoever they feel is the enemy. How do brands think in this kind of environment? You have to, like Joshua was saying before, it was caught, you know, the network caught him off. You have to more than ever recognize that consumers, we are serving consumers. You have to re respect consumers more. You have to really make efforts to not just say it with mouth that consumer is king, but how do you make everything available? So one of the things that companies are doing, for instance, more is they pay more attention to customer service because the consumer now is very quick to dismiss and, you know, and walk away, to close an account and shift, right? Or to stop buying your product. And not even just doing that, can decide to create a trending thing for you on social media against your product, <laughs> you know, or your product experience, you know, your, your brand experience. So. It's not for mouth, you know, permit me to, you know, to you know, speak to quarterly. No be for mouth. We have to be deliberate in recognizing the impact of the consumer is king. We have to create more of our brand experience, business, sales, everything to, to, to make it easier for them to identify why our products are unique. So I give an example. If you used to think that people want to buy one bar of soap on e-commerce. They're not going to buy one bar of soap on e-commerce, right? How do you make sure that you are either doing a bundle of products, so they want to buy a bundle of products? That makes more sense to them. You know, you, you just have to really, really. It's a whole shift in how we think about about consumers. So these are trends that are going to affect everything from your sales strategy, your supply chain approach, right? Because now you are thinking, how do I keep the quality the way it is now? Lockdown, many global countries, some countries you can't import to export to anymore. What do you do with, you know, your local content? So these are real, you know, heavy impacting things that we have to look at. Nobody, when the answers, and I'll, and I'll round up this, you know, because it's such an amazing, you know, um, last thing came out. Let's be honest with ourselves. Many brands, um, people that were leading brands wished personally to, you know, to get involved, right? You know, to make their brand say something. But guess what? Many brands hadn't qualified to be able to speak and associate with that movement, with that youth, 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 you know, youth movement. But they wanted to. 
but they hadn't gotten the credentials. You know, they hadn't gotten that authenticity over time. So a few brands that try to just jump in there and start talking, oh, this is a trend and size, you know, the people <laughs> hit, hit out against them big time. And they even created a phrase. They said, now brands will do this, we will do this for, we will support. You understand? So these are heavy trends that you don't look at it like, this is just a fact, something that passed. No, it's showing a very huge and long-term sustained shift in consumer psyche that we have to interrogate, we have to plan for, and we shouldn't think it is going to go, go, go away anytime soon. So let me, you know, let's let's continue to talk about it. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. D. Uh, Joshua, let's uh, go back to you so that you can actually finish uh, what you were saying before the network uh, put you off. The microphone is muted. Thank you. I just stopped that now. <laughs> now, um, I think we've established that the consumer is no longer king, but is the boss. We've established that um, the confines of um, being able to spot trends is not limited to the social media platforms, but actually in the environment and within the ecosystem that the consumers actually exist. We've also been able to establish from, again, the last conversation from uh, Dayo, the very fact that events also, you know, shapes the trends of these consumers. And I think we may have to some extent been able to create some sort of clarity in terms of, you know, trends that are basic, basic types and trends that are based on consumer behavior in terms of consumer patterns of uh, engaging brands. And the other for me will be understanding that why we exist and why we do what we do is actually to shape the pattern to ensure that these consumers are better served. And that is true, clearly defined consumer connection points. And that was actually what led me to give the examples of what was going on in Oriuki, where I went to in about a massive place. Never knew that such a place existed with the sort of consumers that go there in spite of the, you know, the COVID experience and all. But in, to, to sum that section up and then so that we can move to the next uh, conversation point, is the fact that when we look at the way brands uh, navigate the market today, one other critical way to examine and understand those trends or those consumer behavior or patterns beyond the volume that you see in terms of traction on the goals that are achieved is your competitor analysis. So what are the strategic points that you think that consumers, I mean, sorry, the competition is beginning to take to get to those consumers? Because you've got to have your antenna up as a strategist. You've got to have your you know, antennas up as a brand custodian to understand what is my competition doing now? So while you may be a market leader or category leader, it's also key to understand that those consumers are also watching for the brands that are able to meet their exact needs. So uh, it is why you will find that um, certain, certain brands will come up with a very quick solution as COVID was happening to become innovative. And I don't mean to mention the name of a brand here on this platform, Twisho. Interestingly, I mean, uh, Franklin is, is on call and we worked on this to see how, you know, to shape the dynamics at that point in time because of a need, a need that was changing the face of the globe. And that sanitizer you know, became uh, the solution at a point in time. Not just solution by way of what was already existed, because what existed was, for example, gel. Okay? But the business owners found reason to actually you know, develop a hand and a surface sanitizer that enabled it to connect with the consumers. And in the same space, drive its own business growth. So you're not only experiencing expansion, but also driving profitability. Okay, so how do this then impact on how, you know, consumers uh, are spotted or how, you know, trends are spotted in consumer world? It is simply, like we said, the activities beyond online, um, the competitor analysis, and the whole of all those other activities within the ecosystem. So I think I will stop at this point and, um, let you take us through the next questions or conversations. Thank you. I'd actually like uh, Franklin to weigh in on that conversation as well, that question that I asked. 
Okay, um, thanks. I think um, we've noted um, many different trends, um, you know, occurring in the past few years. I think uh, virtually seeing them come to life in terms of how um, we've enacted them. I think one of them, given from some of the examples my colleagues have said, is um, what I would call radical youth. Um, the manifestation in one area is the thing we called NSAS as of last year. But I'll look at it from a different dimension. Radical youth today is not so much a manifestation of um, you trying to go on the streets to prove a point to government. I believe that is, that is an old system of doing things. Radical youth actually today is about you um, trying to have or share your point of view in whatever way or medium you feel you can get your voice heard. It's actually a reflection of who you are, um, not so much what you are against. Before the term radical, we looked at a new um, revolution um, and you want to get yourself heard against a system. Today, it's more about you fighting against any set rules or boundaries you feel yourself setting. It could be the kind of attire you wear, the kind of makeup you put on, the kind of hairdo you carry, or even how you carry, present yourself. The tone you use when you speak with people, how you address people, you know, um, the kind of accessories or how you even want to decorate your home, you know. So I think radical youth has evolved from a linear format of saying it's me versus you. Rather, it's now what I'll call it's me incorporated. It's about me. It's me first. It's what I want. It might offend you, but I'm not going out of my way to do that. I am just all about me. So, you know, I call it as I call it me incorporated. In some, in some regard, for example, on Twitter, you, if, if I share a perspective, you have what they call um, this thing cut uh, council culture, cut that person off because he's not saying what I like to hear. He's talking about a government employee or um, a policy that I do not support. So, so he's talking trash, so take him out. But for others, it will be, I'm just trying to express my views. You might not like it, you might do. Um, why do you put on black? Because that's what I'm, that's what I'm about. Um, I don't have to put red lipstick like everyone. I just want to put black makeup. So it's about me. I'm not trying to offend you. I like to shave my hair, you know, carry big earrings. It might, it might seem that it's in your face, but I'm not trying to go against you. I'm just trying to do me. So I think that's one of the big things that we see evolve over the first five years as one of the key mega trends. And, and it's been culminating again, especially in media, film and entertainment. But those, when we talk about business, I think one of the big trends we've seen evolve over the past few years would be what I call them authenticity as a product that is bottling it up and productivizing it and saying this is a product that I could carry. And we've seen them from brands like Tiger Beer, um, you know, even using mannerisms and speak like Agu, I put them big posters and, you know, um, big traditional mediums and on social media to expouse what a brand is all about and that the fact that they support a certain kind of culture so it's no longer just about me consuming the brand. It's about these people I'm trying to connect and speak with. What do they like? What's their day in the life? How would they regard my products? What is the role of my products in their day to day? And how can I help make it better for them? So it's sort of, I bottle a normal product, but I weave it around the era um, or aura of authenticity and I Another good example is um, Pedro's Ogogoro. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Um, we know how we regard Ogogoro in this culture, you know, in terms of, you know, low flavor gene, how it's distilled from, you know, um, from, you know, some of our cultures. Um, but once an entrepreneur decided, I can elevate the context of how we regard Ogogoro. So from distillation to presentation, to branding, to speak, to pricing, to where the brand, the environment you see the brand, um, it has in less than two years, you know, elevated the context of how you would see Ogogoro. Now, you know, elitist people are looking for that brand. You can't get them in the supermarket. You only see them at very premium, high-end, you know, shops, retail stops. You don't even see them in, you know, um, um, on e-commerce stores or, you know, your regular bars or this. It has to be, you know, subscribed by, 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 by um, you have to request for it you know, specifically. So that is an entrepreneur bottling a product and saying, if you love what is authentic, the thing that comes from your 
your local environment, your environment. I can bottle it, but you have to buy it at a premium level because it's all about you. So the person is actually selling. I'm selling the brand that exposes and elevates you, you know. And thirdly, another key trend we'll talk about will probably be homegrown hospitality. You know, um, we've been at home for over a year now. Um, some have transformed their homes into offices. Some do one or two or three days. But we've now, everyone, I think we've had a rethink of our homes as you know somewhere you come home to sleep and get out in the morning um people have i know people people that have redesigned their their sitting rooms created study offices but that is in one regard now brands are trying to say how do i connect with people like franklin dior josh and so on and so forth at their homes because they spend so much time at home and besides the the typical home and entertainment other areas could I connect with this brand? And you're seeing innovative brands come to play. And I'm talking local brands. Loungewear is becoming very, very big. Something I know just where, where relax at home, have my meetings, it's presentable, but I can, I can also use stroll out to the nearby supermarket, even go out, you know, loungewear from, you know, um, flunky pajamas to slip-ons, to even how you decorate your furnishings, you know, to your seats. So there are different things coming to life in terms of how people are tapping into basic needs and transforming those things into something that is becoming, you're creating, you're creating something we're used to, but presenting it in a refreshingly new light. You know, it's just like what we did a few years ago for brand like um, from Vitaform, you know, from the physical stores. We're saying, um, you probably use a mattress minimum three to five years. Why would you want to change your mattress? Why would, and you know, sales were deepening across that entire category. And the only way to do that was start creating unique and refreshing experiences around it so that it's not just about coming to buy a mattress when you need it, but perhaps we could make you think, rethink the whole idea about sleep. And, you know, and that's the idea came out about creating um, where the heart lies, um, using that idea to um, create a range of comfort centers where people could actually start come out to experience those products or brands, even when they don't need them, look at how they can contextualize them in their living room spaces recreate those spaces for them and then even experiment with them while outside the home and then before they can say okay i would like to order one or two you know so those are some manifestations that we've seen in terms of you know, bringing some of those trends to life over the past five years and it's very interesting to see what we can do in a, in the next few few months and i think we'll see a whole lot more innovations come into play thank you thank you franklin looking at all of you you have at least 18 years experience in marketing so can you tell me in your marketing career, is there a particular brand that you've seen impacted positively or negatively you know, by trends? So have you seen a brand that trends killed or maybe a brand that uh, trends improved? And I'll start with Joshua. From Joshua, without a break, we'll move on to Dio and then we'll come back to Franklin. Thank you, um, Abans. I like the dimension you took around marketing because that is really a core what we are. Um, it's about brand marketing of the day so um as you were saying that you know again i, I may have to mention brand um coke jumped on my mind one of the driving force for us back then at coke is that we don't um we don't follow the trends i don't know if you've ever seen an ambassador that is a coke ambassador deliberately the brand does not jump on those things you know why because you've got to have a sheer long-term perspective to brand growth. So the brand actually should be the ambassador for the consumers. So I, I take a look at what we did with, um, with, uh, with Coke Side of Life. So the whole idea was, how do I meet the needs of my consumers in Nigeria? If at the time this brand existed, we were always hitting a particular unit case year on year. We never go over that in a unit case. And it was now they said, what could be the issue? How do we serve these consumers better? The idea was to take a global campaign and just give it to the Nigerians and say, oh, this is already trending in other countries. But the difference was to say, what is the consumer behavior the Nigerian consumer so that you actually are serving this Nigerian consumer efficiently, not just effectively. 
because effectively would mean that yes, you are getting it with minimal, you know, fails, but efficiency means you are getting it right and on on, on target. And so the brand it had mean. that research. Can you can you hear me? I hope I'm good. Yes. Oh, you're yeah, good. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. So the brand decided, we, I mean, we just chose to say, you know what, let's check the Nigerian consumer, not looking at what the currency is on the global landscape with you know, other consumers, but the environment, the behavior of these guys here, does it match the culture of the people? And that was actually how we were able to purchase in that company that was a good thing, and then create a Nigeria-centric campaign that met the aspirations and needs of the Nigerians. And after that campaign, or after that you know, activation, and then that was done, for the first time in over 10 years, the brand surpassed the target it has always hit and stayed at. So just assume for purpose of explanation that the brand was always doing a million unit cases every year for over 10 years. But for the first time, the brand went 14, that figure in my head, 14.2% above that target for the first time. Because it took a moment to say, let's understand the consumers, because the consumer is the boss. Not following the trends that were more like the types, points in time, was that there was a need to then also ask ourselves some other critical questions. These guys who currently drink Coke at that time, why did they change? Because of the further insight we did, we then realized that the brand have been communicating with people who used to drink Coke but have migrated to drinking beer and spirit, but we were still communicating to them previously as if they were still there, knowing that new consumers have emerged who have grown in and those previous ones have migrated and no more consuming brands, brand Coke, because of you know, maturity, exposure, and all of that. So, in looking at this, it goes back again to that point around when we talk about it, maybe in terms of the use of the language, we should you know, be able to have that differential you know, uh, in terms of being able to focus on that consumer journey, understanding how the consumer path you know, uh, in, impacts on the decision-making by way of consumer behavior that eventually results in how you know, the consumers absorb and become loyal to a particular brand that they call their own. And you see, when you're able to understand the consumer, appreciate the consumer, respect the consumer, not that I'm doing the campaign for me because I love it, what you'll find is that that brand will get to that point of cognitive dissonance in the mind of the consumer. And cognitive dissonance is that point where no matter what you say to that consumer about that brand, it will say to you, forget it, that brand is my brand. Loyalty is now formally and fully entrenched in the heart of that consumer. So as we look at evolving brands, and as I look at the case study you wanted me to take through, which is I'm looking at you know, Coke now, I see that growth pattern over the years. No, not like we do currently, and I don't think that brand does it, even when they have to do what they call Coke Studio, if you notice all the artists that came on board were not ambassadors. They only just came and featured and go. They were never ambassador of Coke. In the sports realm, where maybe one of our, you know, other brands will do the same, it was not so with that brand. Because deliberately, there was that need to ensure that the consumer is not only the boss, the consumer is appreciated and feel that sense of belonging. And if you see, take a few years down the line, it was why the brand was to go again one step further and start asking people to nominate names that they want on their bottles. So the brand actually is the one that sets the pace in terms of what it is, not just what happens by way of, you know, those imagined wins or imagined types. The brand sets the pace because the brand is showing I'm serving my consumers. And I love what Dio said earlier about the sachet, you know, um, the migration into sachet. If you remember how that happened a couple of years back, a particular male brand was dominating that industry peak at some point. But then these guys came and they asked them what would be their market entry strategy in order to be able to dominate a segment of the market where a particular brand is seen as a king at that time. And how can they come and become, make the consumer the boss in their life? And then this other brand called Carbell came through. And then looking at two critical points, 
affordability, one, and preference. Affordability then became the critical point on which that brand connected with the consumers. And affordability, again, goes back to two things, consumer behavior. Consumer behavior at that point was being influenced by what is the purchasing power of that consumer. And what is the affordability trait of that consumer? And the whole idea is need, because the goal is to meet the need of the consumer. And as professionals in our right, part of what we do is to ensure that we are meeting the needs of the consumers. And as we grow the consumer needs and meet it with stronger values, we're also growing our portfolio in terms of the structure and business that we, we drive. So I, I will stop at this point and let my colleagues speak. I hope that helps. Thank you. And so everyone, um, we will start taking your questions now. So please uh, drop your questions in the chat box so that immediately they finish, we can start taking the questions. We don't want to waste any time uh, on that. So please. And I'm going to call Aki Adeshola to say something about the uh, demassification of the society. Please, I'm going to call on him to say something. I'd like him to say something. So uh, please go ahead, Adifila. Okay, sorry, my, my network went off um, briefly. Uh, I, I think I would, um, I would like to ask a friend. <laughs> I like to use the possibly <laughs> millionaire approach and, you know, see who in the audience, um, you know, you know, has something they would also like to share as an example of, you know, this trend. But let's, let's make it a bit um, interactive. Josh has given a very good um, case study example and has basically used that marketing approach to, you know, you know, to bring it out. So um, unless we want to look at specific, you know, and break the trends into social media trends and then say, oh, okay, this brand, this bank brand jumped on something last year and, you know, consumers gave you know, give them a, you know, give them a negative feedback. So, um, who in the audience? <laughs> this may be a bit unusual for the I, faculty people. Uh, I, you know, but we have to, you know, switch things up. Sahid yes, has exactly. Sahid is, Sahid is right there. <laughs> yeah, it's really. I'm. I'm very honored to be here. I'm not. Can we a, see your face, please. Will it oh, be nice me, enough to show your face? Let me put on my video. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's an honor being here. I'm really um, pursuing marketing on the side. I'm really into IT. But um, last year, what I noticed was uh, the trend of Black Lives Matter in North America. I know Nigeria, you know, we're, we're following it carefully. When it first started, you know, a lot of brands did not want to join because they were scared of the ne negative impact that it could have. And you know, race in North America is a very sensitive area. But guess what? Nike took that risk. They took that risk and they jumped on it and they said, no, we support Black Lives Matter. And that was scary because it could either go, uh, it could either right be very positive for them or it could be very negative for them. But guess what? Nike has made a killing out of supporting Black Lives Matter. And that's just my input. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Sorry, oh, I was wait to oh, let me let me just I'm the who wants to be a millionaire guy now. <laughs> Yomi wants so, to say something. Okay, Yomi, okay, we'll take one more person. Huh? Okay, I I I I see this consistent problem of people taking an event as a trend. Uh, because for a trend to be a trend, it must be something that a behavior, a behavioral set that is consistent with a set of people that the sense of the, the sense they, they kind of find a set a, a consistent meaning across board about it. And SAS, it was not a trend. 
NSAS was an event. The trend in itself is the restive, restiveness of the youth to assert for change. So when people talk about answers and, and the bad doing it as a trend, no. The trend in itself is that the youth of Nigeria were already tired of the system that they had. That tiredness, that restiveness is what the trend should be, not the event. So when people say brand did not key into answers, it was an event which it will be very, very fatalistic of a brand to just jump into without knowing the end result of it. But if they could key into the behavior that underlines the event in itself, which is the youth were tired, the youth were using, uh, they were looking for a voice to assert themselves, it becomes very, very different. So that was a trend. So, so, so that's, that's what I want to point out. And I, I, and I also noticed this consistency in which we have been mentioning um, idea, idea in itself as a trend. Uh, see, what I see trend- Sorry, mentioning words, be, I'll come again. Um, some ideas have been mentioned here as being trend. Um, product ideas and all the rest. What I see trend as is that behavior that people within a huge number of a set or a group are willing to adopt to define what is intrinsic to whether they are need, they, uh, what they feel is necessary. And they, they adopt it as a way of whether asserting themselves or expressing themselves. It's not just one single idea or innovation that tends to be a trend. That means a, a whole lot of people are willing to adopt it. They are willing to jump into it. They, they are willing to find it as a platform of expression of their need. That becomes a trend, not just a singular apple stands that, okay, um, I want to remember um, what somebody said. Um, it, it takes a wider adoption within that set belief of what the trend is about for it to be reasonably a trend. So um, um, crypto, cryptocurrency is a trend right now. A lot of people believe that that's the best form of investment that insulates them from praying high and control of government. Yes, because it's a set of belief that a, a, a huge lot of people key into. I believe I will take it as a trend. So you, you can't just take one singular innovation just because somebody did it and within a niche is getting a little traction that you end it to be a trend that defines a, a huge lot of people. No, I don't believe that. Okay, thank you no. very much, Yomi. Thank you, thank you very much, Yomi Martins for your contribution. Uh, I must please allow me to just quickly give a little clarification. Sure. Um, but again, this is the beauty of it. It's, it's always important to make sure that, uh, you, you know, whatever it is the panelists are saying, there's um, communication happening, which is there's actual interpretation of, you know, what is being said. So uh, the speakers have not said, you know, isolated events. We've always said that it, it is a reflection of certain consumer behavior over time. Uh, Josh really made a lot of effort to, to stress that, you know, even when he spoke initially. And uh, Franklin also spoke about, you know, ending it, first of all, separating the different types of what makes up uh, trends, what are the different types of trends. And then also spoke fully on consumer behavior when he talked about pop culture as a way to look at that consumer behavior and then decide to build something on top of it or to respond to it in a certain way. You could respond to a, an identifiable, to an identified trend with a product, with a future, with, with, with you know, something that you didn't bring into to align with it. So mentioning answers, okay, I think I understand why you may have thought that meant speaking to the event, but like Taiwo Chore, I think wrote there, the, the trend, as you, as, you, as you mentioned, is that restiveness. If I said Sorosoke, <laughs> you know, which, which is like something that, you know, the youth frankly mentioned radical youth and gave some, you know, examples of 
what are those components that characterize the radical youth. So those are the underlying trends that are then giving expression through some of these events, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, matches, you know, the answers, you know, protests, and all of those kind of things. And even the consumer behaviors that show up in even things in how people now shop. Like I gave an example of, you know, how people are now beginning to buy more groceries online. Three, four years ago, shopping for groceries online was like number five in, you know, the top five most uh, shop things on e-commerce in Nigeria. You know, you had fashion, you had electronics and a couple of things, groceries down, down, down. But we've seen that growth. So we take the point, you know, but the, just to give that clarification, we started by describing and defining, you know, trends as consistent patterns. In fact, Joshua also emphasized patterns of consumer behavior. So I don't know what time you, you joined us, but that's the beauty of the communication so that we all get it. The thing is that the way the, the topic is, is described, it's kind of very broad, right? So we're the ones trying to narrow, you know, to put it within the confines of marketing, you know, not just social media trends, you know, which is a different, you know, you know, subset, which is, you know, what people, you know, may want to quickly hear and talk about, but, you know, sometimes that will make us miss out on, you know, what is really, really happening. So I'll hand over back to, the brief faculty. You see, I like to talk. Okay, let me hand over back to our boss. <laughs> well, thank you, Yomi. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, um, Saeed. Yes. As well. uh, yes. And I quite enjoyed uh, your Miss contribution and Saeed's contribution as well. And I'm especially thrilled that uh, Saeed is an IT person who has been adopted into the marketing family. He has a question. So when it comes to question time, I uh, will take his question. I forgot to mention when I introduced uh, Diadefila. That is, he is currently the head of digital marketing at uh, PZ. So uh, I, I did mention that he was in Insight earlier, but he's currently the head of digital marketing at PZ Industries. So Franklin, please go ahead. And Aki Adeshala, immediately after Franklin, you give us a note. I really want to hear about the demasification of the consumer, like you mentioned. Franklin, please. Yeah, but you want me to you speak on the same topic subjects or to clarify what no, no, I, I I want to know, I want you to actually okay well you can speak a bit about what he said but off up, apart from that aside that I'd like you to speak about what trend you have noticed or what major trend you have noticed that any brand has benefited from or uh, that has maybe caused a dent on any brand in your marketing career and it does have to be something that happened last year it could actually be any time during your career okay um, the key one, maybe of recent memory, would be, uh, like you said, rethinking the whole essence of value, you know, and what you call value tenants, you know, where it's no longer just moving away from what you look at, um, um, from products or marketers, looking at it from, let me reprise a product or change the repricing regime. Now, one key example we tapped into that for was maybe Pepsi Long Trucks in terms of a campaign or communication that you can bring to life. But what we noticed over time was a lot of products, brands, and marketers were trying to understand or decipher what value meant. For example, um, within past six months, you agree with me that what we regard as value has changed. What you take a value in terms of how you would regard value. In fact, between January and February, in the past few months, it has, I'm going to see that continually evolve as the um, Naira depreciates as infl inflation grows up and a lot of um, policies are being put into place. Brands, marketers, organizations, me and you will tighten our belts to revalue the things that concern us most. You know, that is a big shift and that is something that we're going to be seeing. So do you think the concept will now be what exactly is luxury today? Luxury would be a high-end perfume for you last year. Luxury for me today will be my electricity tariff fare, right? So exactly what is value if we look at that as a major thing? So if you now go back into organizations, the, the, the difficult question for them to crack is, what premium would you place on value? What would you call a mass market brand? And what would you call a mass customized product brand today? And we saw that about four or five years ago as a trajectory that was evolving, 
So said, instead of fighting the pricing wars, as it were, how can we productivize this trend using one of the brands that we have? And we only tapped on it for a very short period of time. It wasn't a long as period. It was what can we do for three to six weeks, make a whole huge noise about it, milk it, of course, for sales, because we know it will probably, things will probably you know, change over our time. And so that is why the whole concept or idea, um, in fact, that was why we generated that whole thing in terms of um, how do we tap into culture to make it much more meaningful and relevant, which is we long for so much more, for so much appetite, for so much culture, for so much, much more than you deserve. So that's where the whole thinking about, you know, and of course, it was something we also understand from a Nigerian concept. Uh, from a Ghanaian or Rwanda concept, it probably it wouldn't make any big dent, you know, which is what else would you long truth for? What else do you long for? And, you know, and we brought that trend and said, okay, let's use one of our products. And we used the whole, we did the whole uh, Pepsi long truth campaign. But in terms of the trend that we tapped into, it was rethinking the whole essence of what value is and how can you create entertainment from discussing a boring topic or subject or shift as value, which I called valuetainment. So that was one thing we tapped into from a positive, from a positive context. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before, you, before Akin speaks, let me just write on what um, uh, Franklin just you know, pointed out. And again, this is actually one of the beauty of this conversation we've had today. Um, you recall the long truth campaign at that time. That trend was actually birthed by the brand. So again, speaking to needs, you know, speaking to consumer behavior, having that insight to understand that affordability issues are there for the brands, I mean, for the consumers, and the brand saying, how do we connect with them? How do we show empathy that we understand their concerns, that they want more for less, that they can afford so much more? And so as a brand, how do we connect with them? How do you drive that consumer connection platform? And when we did that then for Pepsi, that was 2016, I hope I'm right, uh, frankly, 2016, you'll see how at that point in time, you know, the brand projected the needs of the consumers. And not that something was just going in the air and the brand just tapped on it, but there was a basic necessity to ensure that these consumers are served. And that keys quickly into what Sahid said earlier on the Black Lives Matter you know, issue. I recall 2014, I mean 2004, major issue I had with someone, it was right there in New York. And Black Lives Matter have been forever. It's actually dear in the, in the lives of the people. It's racism of the highest order. And we saw it recently when the Capitol happened. So what did Nike do? Nike understands that this is a pain point of the consumers. It is a need for the consumers that has to be met for someone to speak for them, to amplify the needs of this black race. And so they tapped into it and they connected with that need that is there as a consumer behavior, which is being fought at the back end, but nobody is there to actually loud it or using Taiwo's word, Sorosoke it, if I may say that way. So it's important for us to see how this connects. So the connection point that is critical for us is what sort of insights do we have into consumer behavior that taps into the needs of the consumers? That, like we said, kings don't have power again because even kings run to bosses now, marketing directors, CEOs to go and seek for sponsorship. So now the consumer is the boss who dictates where the boss, where the, the marketers should come to and what they should do. And to that extent, the power of consumer behavior, the intent to understand the fabrics of the consumer's desires is so important for us when we are talking about trends, separating it from the tides and winds and looking at it from the point of view of the consumer needs that help us to build brands, grow portfolio, and expand the base for profitability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kadeshola, please. 
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, forgive me, I'm uh, ensconced in some hotel room somewhere far, far, far in the north of Nigeria. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> A very, very, very interesting conversation so far. And um, I mean, I, I actually expected no less seeing the, the caliber of people that uh, we have on the stool this evening. Um, I think they're all people that I know fairly well, and I know exactly uh, uh, the, the, the strength of their, of their thoughts on the question of trends. Um, maybe let me start by commenting first on the point that uh, Yomi Matis raised earlier on. I think it's a great point he made uh, about the question of trends versus events. However, let me say that the difficulty in understanding trends or in discussing trends is that they are often recognized and understood in hindsight. Uh, therefore, one of the reasons why we're having this conversation is because of the efforts by brands to catch trends uh, at their point of emergence. And that explains why we sometimes tend to use events to make sense of trends. But I think the key is in what Daya Defilas said earlier on that the value of a trend is insight. I believe that what he means by that is that a trend will be useless to a brand that is not able to draw critical insights from it uh, to understand consumer behavior and therefore advance the interest of the brand, which I think is the real point of what Joshua has said and what uh, Franklin you know, has also said. Uh, so I did mention something about the demassification of society. Uh, very many, many years ago, I read uh, a couple of books by this futurist called Alvin Toffler. And I think it's an interesting, it might, the, the books might, might sound old now, I mean, when you read them, but I think it'd be nice for anybody uh, who is interested to go back and look for those books. One is the, the future shock, and the other one is uh, the third wave both by the same writers, Alvin Toffler. Uh, long before uh, personal computers became, you know, a thing, before we even thought about it, he looked into the future and, and uh, he predicted that uh, personal computers were going to, to come into play uh, at a time when we had uh, what we called a mainframe computers. Uh, which could be the size of a massive, uh, maybe three-story building, the type of building that uh, inside communications uh, had. Uh, Dayo, I'm sure you know <laughs> what I'm talking about uh, at, uh, at um, Troika House. Uh, a mainframe computer could be that big. But Alvin Toffler foresaw that uh, personal computers were going to come into play and he then said that the result of that was going to be what is called the demassification of society because mass you know market economies had evolved as a result of the industrialization uh, which saw people moving from agrarian uh, you know societies into uh, uh, urban centers where everybody you know had to be there i think what he could not or did not uh, what he did not or could not have foreseen uh, is the depth of the impacts that the development of personal computers was going to have. And I'm not even sure that he could ever have envisioned how speedily internet technology would develop to the point where we're at now. And that's what brings me to the point that's been mentioned severally with regards to, you know, the NSAS protest. Uh, going back to the question of using events to try to understand trends. What we saw there was that computer technology com uh, uh, combined with internet technology and everything that's happened so far has put so much power into the hands of the consumer or the individual consumer that everybody now is not, we're not even talking about ourselves as consumers any longer. We are now a government to ourselves. And I think really that is where the challenge is going to be in the future. Because the more power that technology puts in the hands of the individual consumer, the greater the fissures we are going to see in society. And it is those fissures, those divisions, you know, those cracks, those fault lines that we are seeing now that that is where brands need to begin to look. I'll give you an example. 
uh, there's a beer brand that is trending well that maybe in the last two, three years, you know, did massively well in the southeastern part of the country because it played on, uh, you know, certain sensitivities that is, you know, really entrenched in the history of our country. I believe that we all know what we're talking about. Maybe I will mention the name here, it's Hero Brand, you know. Now, that is an example of a brand that tapped into a trend. It was a trend that it saw with the rise of bodies like IPOB, Masob, and all of those. And so it, so to speak, climbed on top of a hill, looked into the future, saw where people were going, and then it tapped into that. And it's helped the brand so tremendously. But then the challenge is, uh, yes, the brand could see that, but there is so much more that technology is doing to the individual consumer, putting so much power into the hands of the consumer that we do not know where, uh, the only thing we can say is God help us. And, and if brands are not careful, those sensitivities could either help them or could kill them. So I think those are just my few thoughts on this. Thank you very much for- Thank you, thank you, Akinade Shola. Uh, we'll take questions now, and I want to start with Shola. Shola, are you still here? Please unmute your microphone, you know, turn on your video and ask your question so that we can quickly um, answer it. Uh, Shola Alonga, are you still here? Yes, I am. Uh, good evening. So, good evening. Go ahead. Uh, I just uh, dropped a comment uh, on the question I was trying to ask. I think this is a very interesting conversation that we are having. And I, I like that there's been a lot of um, comments about how trends are understood in, hand, in hindsight, right? And I just find, uh, I find it problematic trying to convert your understanding of an insight or your understanding of a trend uh, and trying to, you know, convert that into value for a business that you are servicing. Because sometimes people who make the decisions in some of those businesses believe in arresting problems that are right in front of them or do not necessarily believe in the fact that these trends can affect their businesses as much as, you know, we've seen uh, over the last 15, 20 years in some of the major global businesses. So the, the question basically is, how do you convince a business owner to take a chance? Because, you know, following trends is almost like a gamble when you look at it. There is evidence, you know, that supports that this might happen. And at the same time, there is evidence that also, you know, um, can prove that it will not happen. And yeah, you take several chances and sometimes, you know, uh, something magical happens and then other times it doesn't. So how do you get to a point where you're able to get businesses to jump on these trends with you to, or to create these trends or to acknowledge the fact that this is something you are projecting and it's very possible and they are willing you know, to go on that journey with you. Thank you, Shola. Uh, Joshua will take a question, but not now. I'd like uh, Benga, Uluk Benga, James Kukoyi, ask your question so that we can then take both of them together. Uluk Benga, James Kukoyi, are you still here? Joshua, please note the question that Shola asked. How do you get a brand to take a chance on, um, on trends? So for example, using the example that Sahid gave, the uh, Nike thing could have gone either way, actually, to be honest, it could have gone the other way around. There were no guarantees that it was going to go positive. So, I mean, it, it's a chance. And as business managers, marketing directors, heads of businesses, how do you convince them to take that kind of chance? So, Dinga, um, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, go ahead, please. And yeah, can we um, see your face, please? There's not too much to ask. I think, I think the video is on. Can you hear me? Yes, the video, yes, but I can't hear you very well. Can you maybe speak a bit louder? Yes, I've seen you. Hello, can you hear me now? Uh, if you could speak a bit louder, that would be great. I think we can hear you now, Benga, and welcome. That's uh, okay. from Cape Town, I guess. <laughs> thank you for joining All us. Right. Please go ahead. Um, thank you so much for this very good platform. My, my question is, um, 
I, I see that focus has been on uh, majorly on fast moving consumer goods. Um, I'm looking at how can uh, IMC trends benefit service organizations, uh, particularly those involved in skill development, capacity building, and what have you. And also, I want to make a comment quickly about um, uh, events and uh, trend. Will it be possible for organizations to benefit from events, even though it may not be sustainable in the long time, but on the short run, some events are able to help uh, businesses to make quick wins that may be very substantial in terms of bottom line. How applicable is that to uh, the points that have been raised uh, initially in terms of uh, trends, events, and, the, and yes, trends and events? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Franklin will take Benga's question, and Joshua will take um, Shala's question. Quickly, please. Thank you very much, Shala. And, um, and frankly speaking, this is a very, very beautiful question, an intelligent one too. I'm saying that because it is something that I'm currently studying. Um, I'm a data scientist beyond whatever I'm doing currently. So my master's, which I'm working on, is on data science. And one of the things that we are doing currently on that program is navigating these sort of trends and using them, you know, uh, there's a difference between business intelligence and data science using AI or machine learning. So business intelligence tends to look at a backward trend and then help you to use hindsight to then forecast the future. But this current subject on data science actually uses the models and algorithms to define a pattern of how a current situation Maybe I don't know if Saeed is in this field. A current situation will help you map out potential action for the next two to five years. Now, to do that, we require a huge level of investment from businesses. And it is when you have that. So, for example, right now, I can, if I get some data, even sift them down from current trends on social media. With Power BI, I can analyze them and use Tableau to then further redefine it and show you the potential actions that it could result in. That is one of the beauty of data science today. And by implication, I'm saying to all of us on this platform, um, is high time we connected with the fifth industrial revolution and not you know, keep ourselves within this base of you know, what we're currently doing. We've got to move forward and move faster as technology emerges. So how will this trend help business, I mean, help to benefit business owners or marketing directors and the likes? Critically, first is how and if they are willing to even invest in that tool so they can see the future because the future is very clear. Um, but without mindset word also, this event can actually become a pattern. You can look at it from by way of a pattern or by way of a trend. Um, I was talking earlier about what happened with, uh, I think it was I mentioned Black Lives Matter, and then we we're talking about even the NSAS issues. These are systemic conversations. They've been there, they just been hidden. Something just threw it out. And so the brands, knowing fully well that this is something that is radically you know, very, very much of a brand truth connected with them. And the same way, if you have such results, you have such patterns, and it's very clear that the consumer behavior over the years, having one of themselves defending themselves, or having one of themselves being able to, you know, fend for themselves, like Akin said, becoming a government by themselves, then it's an opportunity for the brand to, you know, capitalize on that. It's your ability, our ability, not just yours, our ability to show that pattern to the client that is key. The client will not just buy into a fad. The client will not just buy into, you know, uh, it's happening now, when some banks do, but understand that they want to see the pattern. A core marketing director or marketing person wants to see 
what are those analytics saying? And so that if he invests in his money into it, he will get the right um, returns. So I hope that helps, uh, Shala. Yes, sir, that, 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 that certainly does. I, I'm very interested in learning how to build those cases. And I think one of the things you've mentioned now, which I think has been missing, is the data to actually support you know, uh, the cause and how companies need to invest. Exactly. In getting that data. Yeah. And uh, Benga, good afternoon. Is it good evening over there? Nice seeing you again, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, go, Franklin, please. please. Joshua's question. Please, please can you take been, on, um, the last question about events? Thank you. Yes, he was asking that the focus has been mainly on uh, FSCGs. So, but that how will, you know, how does the trend and, and, you know, whatever that goes with an insight and all of that, how does it affect service companies? So I, I think he probably works in maybe like a consulting firm uh, that deals in knowledge and training and all of that. So really, how does it affect a service company against FMCGs? Because our main focus has been on FMCG. Uh, I think it's very easy to jump onto those kind of um, case studies or examples because we'll, people readily would understand um, an idea or a case study about a product that you can actually own, you know, physical product. It's easy for it to come to mind. But I actually think the work actually starts with um, strategic planning. Um, trend is a very big discipline that we've not even touched the surface in this market. Um, what we usually do is share case studies of trends. And I understand your last question earlier in terms of how do you even leverage those kind of things? Because we've not actually, you know, dimensioned the entire value chain of what trends are. And that's why some people are quick to pick on the very easy paths to that, that are snackable and easy to assimilate and use them to say, okay, this brand is doing that. Perhaps we can also do the same. In terms of service, it's actually about the rigor of thinking. Um, if you're in the service business, either it's in our kind of line of business marketing communications or consultancy, or in terms of even hospitality, it's about creating an ecosystem that leverages that trend and saying, if I were to work in terms of create a consumer decision journey, a day in the life, where are all the inherent gaps and opportunities that are currently existent in terms of current consumer behaviors, in terms of what would happen if there were to be a shift or a trigger along this pattern, and then what are the things I could foresee? Now, the best way to usually create these things is usually what I'll call the champions of the idea. So on the business side, I would rather work with someone that can take a decision, a decision maker, and maybe someone also in marketing to discuss as a team what, first of all, their business objective is, and business objective and ambition. That is that because we have a lot of model kits for trends marketing. You know, it's not just about a popular case study. And a very good way to do that is we start from the concept of hindsight, which my associates have talked about, where we usually focus on the perspective of hindsight, you know, and then all the way to in terms of, and that's what traditional research does, which they do very well in terms of what happened in the last seven days, what happened yesterday, what have you seen um, based on all the assumptions in terms of what you are used to. A consumer, or this thing cannot tell you what will happen tomorrow. It can only tell you based on the box that they have lived in. So that's traditional research, which is good. It gives you a background to leverage in. So if I'm talking about the hospitality business as service in itself, I'll look at, I'll model that in terms of what kind of rooms um, would you like us to create for, create for you? Um, if you come here, who would you, what kind of um, music would you like to listen to? If I'm transporting from one place to the other, would you like your driver to wear a uniform or not? But based on the parameters of what that consumer have, that is the kind of information they will give you. So there's a limit to an FGD or a traditional as about what has happened. Now, where you jump in terms of insights to foresight is, um, what are the assumptions I could make? If I trigger it in A, what could be the outcome in B and C? That's what we call scenario planning. If I trigger in, in C or D, what could happen? Scientific, it's also scientific, you know, this whole process in terms of this thing. Um, if I use the customer trend model in terms of what are the possible innovations if I trigger you in B and C? So those assumptions are made but on credible things that are actually happening today. But you create a scenario, scenario A, scenario B, and scenario C 
It's not one person who creates a document that says, these are the trends, go jump on it that way. No, it's actually very scientific based on data, things that have happened. But the work you have to do is, how can I forecast based on a particular trend wave, which is why we say trends are about patterns. It has occurred over time, which is why we say, we usually look at three models. One, we look at um, basic human needs. If you don't understand that, then it's gonna be confusing. Trends are based on basic human needs. What are the innovations that have come out because of those basic human needs? Secondly, what are the drivers of change? What are the things that are instigating change? For example, we've used um, the, a lot of the inherent you know, frustration that has culminated with youth for a long period of time. So it's, it's, it's good for you to just pick up the event, hence as, as it. No, it's a trigger. Something triggered it. It wasn't the trend. It was driver of change. Different things happened. It just, that, that, that thing, something just threw it up. And then the thirdly, what are the innovations that people are creating around this trend wave? Now, if you look at those things happening, then as a business or as a service, I would say, should I jump into creating premium bedrooms, basic bedrooms for two, 2,000 era, premium bedrooms, or can you rent rooms per the, per the hour? That would be an interesting thing as a service. But it takes me, I have to curate those assumptions. If I, if I, um, curate bedrooms per an hour and I sell it as a service, who would be the target audience? It will definitely change from those who are coming to pay 50,000 Naira a month. But it's an assumption I've made, but it's a credible assumption because I've based it on three or four scenarios. So I walk backwards to ensure that I create those products or service or utility or tools or experience that will mitigate any of those things that you create with. Otherwise, if I just jump into one seemingly comfort zone, then it will hit you and you say that trend did not work. No, it's also there's also an element of risk involved because you are forecasting in terms of what would happen if you do this. You have to invest in that foresight. It's not enough to just have the insight. Okay, these are the insights. You have to turn that insight into a credible idea that you can leverage. Otherwise, it's just I can, um, 10 marketers can have the same insights about a, a noodle brand or a biscuit. But in terms of who leverages it for the future, that's the person that will win. Who takes it beyond something on a plate, or on a slide, to actually curating a business, a service, a product based on that insight is the person that wins. And not all of them will win, some will fail. In our client, we have to accept we don't like taking risks. It's part of the problem. So it's not just the trend itself. It's we as a people, as a culture. Why it's big in other places, you hear of the results, the wins. They fail a lot. They do a lot of research. A lot of R&D is invested in a lot of these things. They fail. We don't want to fail. According to us, it's not our portion. We're not going to fail. So we don't want to take that risk. We only want to do what someone has done. And I can tell you what someone has done is not really innovative. It's incremental innovation. It's just you're building on someone's success. How many of us are really credible say, this is a trend that we feel will change the wave. I want to tap on it. Nobody will put their marketing dollars. They'll say, just give me that thing that's worked before. I can tell you for free. We, we experience this every day. I probably will not do it the same. So I'm not saying I'm champion. I will probably not even put my money on something I've not tried before. It's our way of culture. So we have to be able to manage that in itself as a, as a friction, you know, as, as, a, a, as an issue. Besides just marketing a product or service, we have to be able to present an idea and sell that foresight, you know. And I think it's, if we can manage that well, then it, it, it would help us it will help us in the creation, you know, of some of these things we're talking. Otherwise, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it next year. It will just be something that sounds nice with big case studies, but we'll never really jump on it. I, I put something on the chat line, and when Shola asked a question, and I took some notes, and, he, and that question he asked was very credible because we face it day to day with some of our, some, some of our clients. And the reason is because we look at it as something that is candy and sweet. That's what we look at strength. It's popping. It's popular. Oh, it's, tre it's trending. No. That's not what professionals should say. The question we should ask is, why is it happening now? That's the first question, why? Who is making it trend? Who or what is making it trend? Two, how can I jump on the trend wave? Can I jump on it as it's trending or can I go back and create my own trend wave so I can milk it for success? Most of us don't start or milk, create trends. We jump on it when it's high up there or we see everyone jumping on it and we want, we want to create it. But like I said, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a discipline in itself that we've probably not touched in a lot of market departments, you know, and we could, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to share that uh, on board after this, but I think just to, to, to save time, that is just some of the perspectives I, I will share. So we need to move from just hindsight to insight to foresight. That's what trends are about. It's about what's next.
But what's next is about starting today to create those things that will enable a better tomorrow for products, for service, services, and even for you as an individual. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franklin. That was so insightful. Uh, Diade Fila would like to uh, say a word or two on Shola's question. Diade, are you here with us? Yeah, just, I'll, I'll keep it. Yes, I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. So I'll just make it very, um, very brief. So there are different scenarios, but the main thing is how do you get people to buy into um, an innovative idea, right? And that you really believe it's important. Let me start by saying something. Um, and this is for all of, all of us in marketing advertising. There's some phrases we use that put us into trouble, how we think by ourselves. When we say jump on a trend, already it, um, it kind of forces us into a way of thinking and looking at something. So please, <laughs> you know, just think about it again before you say that, that expression, jump on a trend, because it already kind of like gives you a bias, you know, a way of looking at what is happening. Now, I'll give you a quick example of a very classic scenario. So um, at PZ, a um, couple of years ago, we're not on e-commerce. Other brands were on e-commerce. But, you know, like we've said, it's not just because other people are there, right? You look at what can you see as your own evidence of truth, of fact, of consumer behavior, okay? So uh, one of the things that you, you do when you, you believe you've seen a clear opportunity is you need to marshal some kind of evidence or facts. Josh spoke about that. Get some data, you have to get some data, right? Now get some data, then let me take something from what um, Franklin spoke about, champions, people that can help you to champion an idea, okay? So what I realized was that um, selling this in Nigeria was gonna be a very tough call because the focus for our market is more open market, you know, you know, not, 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 not online. And if you wanna create a, route, a new route to market, it takes a lot of, change in operational structure, all kinds of stuff. So what I did was I first of all did what you could call, first of all, got the research. I got an agency that I could work with. And then I did what you can call a minimum viable product. So it's not really a product, but it's more of test running something. Find a way. There must be a way to test run that thing you are thinking is, is viable. If you can't find a way to test it, to assess your assumption, it's gonna to be tougher. Right. If you have something to test, you can have something to show. I say, oh, okay, look at it. This is something that I've added to the existing research that has been done. So what we did is we worked with that agency maybe years ago, did some online activities on e-commerce, this and that. And we took some learning from that, right? We took some learning from that. And that learning helped us to set up in Kenya faster for different operational reasons, it was easier for me to take that learning and say to the guys in Kenya, look at what we're saying in your market, in our market, look at the reports, research, ETC, ETC, consumer shopping behavior, blah, blah, blah. Let's have a phased approach to getting into this space. Note, phased approach. Sometimes when people want to sell an idea they believe in, they just want to give that giant you know, change immediately. Look, it is always difficult to sell that big change from day one. Right. And when you present it like that to the marketing director, you know, it's like, ah, you want to spend this X amount of money like that. Usually, you know, you, you just automatically get that little, you know, you know, drawback, you know, from there. So think of how you, you must get some data. Think of the people that you can buy, sell that idea to internally in that place. Think of what way can a demo look like? What way can a test run look like? What way can a minimum viable product and if it is about you trying to, to identify with a cause, if you feel the organization doesn't understand purpose-driven brand building, for instance, which is something you know, we haven't really spoken about, right? Brands with purpose, which is another huge trend. Yes, let's call it a trend that consumers are showing an interest in. Let their brand not just be all about making profit. Let your brand identify with something. It could be mental health, it could be you know, child mortality, whatever it is. If you feel that is not there, get some research, get a way to present, get a way to sell that idea. Look, it's hard work, right? People that pioneer stuff know that is hard work. So that is the process. Get those people, just start, right? Learn from it. Maybe your first attempts won't work, but you will learn something from that approach and then you can have something to build on. But guys, please 
let's try to avoid saying jumping on trends. It already biases your mind, it already skews you in a way of looking at you know, something versus identifying what is hindsight, what is insight, and like frankly said, what is the foresight? What can you do with that insight that you have? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just by uh, just to introduce the brief faculty, uh, we are a professional community for brand communications and marketing professionals to network, learn, collaborate, and cross ventilate ideas. And uh, of course, it doesn't have any payment to go with it. Free. If you'd like to join us, I've put a WhatsApp group, um, group link in the chat box so you can um, just click on it and join immediately uh, so that you, know, you can be a part of us. And we hold the mentors on school, on school session every uh, once a month and we also hold every Wednesday, we also hold a chat in the WhatsApp group and it's all uh, about brands, brands and marketing communication. So please, uh, the link is in the chat uh, box, so please go ahead and join us. And um, uh, uh, facilitators today, for today, we'll, we'll give you two minutes each to just drop your closing remarks. Um, what's your takeaway point? What do you want to leave with us today as per trends and brand communication? Two minutes each, just leave a word for us. I'll start with um, Joshua, then Franklin, and then Daya Defiler. Well, uh, thank you very much, Agons. First is to remind us that as professionals, um, our role is not to place ourselves as the target of whatever messaging we are sending out, even if we use ourselves as, um, as guinea pigs. The focus should always be on the consumer, and that consumer is the boss. Well, I think Joshua has an uh, internet uh, issue. Frankly, Sorry, did you guys hear me at all? I was hearing you. Yeah, yeah I think good. Maybe at once you, you're it having was, some feedback. It was at once, it was at once myself that I had issues. <laughs> 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 so go ahead, sir. <laughs> so uh, reminded us that principally, we must remember to position that consumer as the boss. Our goals, our plans, strategies, should be how do we serve them better by connecting the brands to them. And to have that happen is very important to understand the insights around the consumer behavior. What are those things that impact on the consumer's journey? What is it that influences him? What is that thing that you know, freaks him out? What is that thing that excites him? That is actually how we need to navigate our path to connect them with the brand. But above all, it is also knowing fully well that trends, maybe it's semantic also, we should be mindful of how we use it very well so we don't equate trends with tides or waves or happenstances. But we're saying that those innate, very, very impactful, you know, um, um, psychological things, behavioral things that enables the consumer to stick with the brand. How do you ensure that that continues to happen? And to make it easier, always remember that there's nothing better than being able to look back, look in, and look forward. I don't want to use the word insight, foresight, and so that we speak those terms that are easier for us to grasp. So I'll leave it at this point in time, as I also encourage you to read forward to enlighten yourself, to study more, and don't be, you know, um, high family sent with uh, just picking theories. Let's look at it very well. I'm talking to all of us on the platform right now, because that is what this industry depends upon, to be able to have the sort of respect that it deserves. So thank you very much, and have a very beautiful weekend. Thank you, Joshua. Franklin, your two cents yes, for us as we you. close. Yes, thanks. Um, it's like going back to the basics. Um, as humans, we will experience issues every single day, but inherent in every issue is an opportunity to create something new. Every issue or um, conflict that we're trying to create across is an opportunity for, you know, to do something magical, to get, to get innovation. I think we just go back to the base in terms of 
before jumping into trends, marketing and everything, as individuals, uh, as business owners and people that work for others, first of all, it's just find a common purpose, you know, in terms of um, what do you stand for? What do you want? You know, why do you want to go about anything you are pursuing? If you can actually start from that singular, simple treatise, then it's easy for you to create and bring alive your ambition, whether it's an experience, whether it's to create an identity, whether it's to design a platform, whether it's to embrace a community. I think those things will put you on the right path towards whether you're pursuing trends, marketing, sales, service, or just to make yourself champion about anything. So let's start from ourselves. Let's be brave. It's a whole new world, a whole of opportunities out there. Thank you. Thank you. Daya Defila. Thank you, Agwans. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having us on the call today. Um, very simple. Uh, let us be deliberate with understanding deeply our consumers, uh, our markets, our products. What we see today is going to shape what you're going to come up with tomorrow, either in a way to serve these customers better. And when you can serve the customers better, you get better value from your activity. So that's, that's the crux of it, right? Um, if I can't um, make the life of that consumer better, the consumer is not going to have any strong preference for my brand. Uh, he won't talk about that. He or she won't talk about that brand. You know, I'm on and on and on. But um, lastly, um, I want to say that uh, the world is, 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 is changing very rapidly and we're all part of this collective now. And the collective is evolving at a fast pace, is mobilizing itself. And as brands, we have to think about the power of the people. This is what um, Donald Trump masked in a way for his, his own purposes. This is what you see with the Reddit gang going against short stocks and shortening stocks. This is what you see with the youths <clears throat> in Nigeria now. So brands, we have to be deliberate. We have to have a purpose for our brands now. Our brands can't just only sell products. We have to understand and identify the things that our audiences are passionate about. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I'll call on Demola Adeshala to give the vote of thanks on behalf of the brief faculty and to say one or two things as we close in the next two minutes. We like to keep the time. We said five to seven and it's exactly 6.57 p.m. Thank you so much, Agbons. Um, I mean, doing the job well as usual. I want to give thanks to you guys, um, mentors who, uh, I mean, role models to some of us, you know, some that we, 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 we follow your your, um, your, your, your teachings and, and some of these things. One, thank you for, for joining us. Um, and also to everyone who had um, joined in on the call today. Thank you so very much. Um, like Agbon said, this is brief faculty. And what we do here is to see how we can harness, you know, the strength of every one of us, bring the people together and we can relate, we can learn and see how we can, you know, uh, present a more formidable uh, marketing force, you know, in this country. So thank you so much. Um, like you said, every month we do this, um, you know, so something special will be coming next month. Um, I don't know, Agmont, do you want to <laughs> give a bit off, you know, so that people can... No, 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 we, we won't give out. Just expect something very grand for March, okay. which is the International Women's Month. So oh, you already give it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, interesting. So thank you so very much, everyone. Um, we want to appreciate you for joining us. All right, bye for now. Thank you, everyone. So um, till till next month for the Mentors on Stool session. But for um, the, for the for those who have been in the brief faculty group, we do um, <coughs> this every Wednesday. Actually, we discuss brands. Uh, Taiwo, you're disturbing us. Fantastic. So I've muted her. So we do this every Wednesday. We discuss brands. We discuss marketing communications in general and how to move our, our, our brands forward. We have um, different um, kinds of people in the group. We have people who own agencies, people who are marketing directors, people who uh, brand managers, you know, and all of that, but everybody in the Macombs, in the IMC industry. 
So thank you. Um, look forward to seeing you next month. And if you're in the group, look, looking forward to seeing you, of course, every day because we do have discussions <laughs> um, often. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. I want to thank you for a good job. Ademola, well done. Well done, thank guys. You, well done. Have thank a great you. Day. Yeah, yes, you too. Uh, Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.